account's prophetic mantle in the 29th chapter, verse number 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, and the plans I have for you are to prosper you and not to harm you. I have plans to give you hope, and I have plans to give you a future. I want to preach for a little while today using as a subject, it's not about you. Uh, it's not about you. Look at the person beside you, tell them it is not about you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 150 years later, it appears as if America is far more comfortable pronouncing immigration than they are enunciating emancipation. And all the more, what are the effects it's had on the fiber of this nation? J. Hector Coursier wrote extensively as a French immigrant into the New World when he declared, I envy no man's prosperity. I wish no other portion of happiness than to give my children each their own farm so that they may become independent American farmers. The language and the psychosis of this French immigrant, the philosophy that he held was a lot different from the original settlers who were pilgrims because it was the pilgrims' intentionality to build a community for God. Immigrants then came into America not to build a community for God, but to chart out a course for their own success. This mindset put in motion an atmosphere of individualism. It should be noted that the generation after the March on Washington has been categorized by history as the me generation. The generation after the March on Washington is considered the me generation because rather than saving up for their kids' education, they remodeled their houses. And if they didn't remodel their houses, they paid for plastic surgery for themselves. The generation after the March on Washington retired from the movement and ran to the mall. And when they got to the mall, they purchased pet rocks. And their pet rocks mirrored their psychosis about raising children. Because pet rocks don't have to be fed. They don't have to be walked and they don't have to be loved. And when you lose interest, you just put the rock down. When the me generation joined the church, we baptized egocentrism. And you'll notice that something shifted in our psychosis that affected our spirituality. We hired architects to build mega churches that look like the temple of capitalism, which is malls. And so now these big churches have absolutely no spiritual imagery, no steeple, no cross, no picture of Christ, no Last Supper, no Jesus walking on water. Why? Because the pastor said we can earn some other money if we rent it out. And so we've lost the sanctity of the sanctuary. And so this is nothing more than a convention hall. And so no longer do you hear the gospel being preached, take up your, your cross and walk with God. Now you listen for the announcements, cooking class will be Thursday. And then after the me generation came my generation. And my generation is a generation of latchkey kids who had to come home alone because both parents had to work just to keep utilities on. And so my generation has a sense of no connectedness but fostered foster care. Because you're dealing with a generation that had to raise themselves. 
The generation after me is considered Maisha millennials who are being raised now by the Gen X generation and because we weren't raised by parents, we're overcompensating by becoming helicopter parents. So we're all encompassing on everything that our child is doing. You get in the Facebook page just to see what they're doing. You want to be their friend. You're dressing like them because you are overcompensating for the parental guidance you never got as a child. So as a consequence, the millennials we are now raising have a false sense of overprotection and entitlement. So they have an attitude if you can't buy them $150 tennis shoes. They act as if you're supposed to upgrade their phone every 18 months. They have a better computer than you do without the requirements of work. So we're now raising children who don't know how to vacuum, who have no understanding of what it means to take out the trash, y'all ain't talking back to me, and have no concept that you have some responsibility in this house. So they sit home and watch TV as your plantation owner waiting for you to come home and cook them dinner while it is that they come back home with these on their report card and then you have the nerve to reward the fact that they have mastered mediocrity in the sociological book entitled soul searching the religious and spiritual lives of american teenagers the author coins an expression that this new generation of christians that we have raised of what their theology is their theology is what the author calls moralistic therapeutic deism moralistic therapeutic deism which says religion is a therapy that suggests God exists to meet my needs I am not living to meet God's will and in that kind of psychosis of thinking we are not looking to please God we're looking for God to answer our prayer so we come to church with a genie mentality that if I rub the bottle right, then the God or the higher power of the universe will give me what I'm looking for that will call me to do anything. And so we have no theology, we have no doctrine, we have no principles, we just have praise. So nobody is calling us to repentance, nobody is calling us in the fasting, nobody is calling us in the sacrifice, we just give you a pablum ministry that says if you shout and turn around three times and give your neighbor a high five within 30 days everything that you've been shouting for is getting ready to happen with no accountability that you got to treat people right that you you got to give to the poor that you got to remember the least of these and so we come in waiting for our powerball number to be called that when god blesses me this when i'm about first this way i'm a move this is the kind of car I got my eye on but nothing that says God what do you want from me so nobody comes to church crying at the altar God any way you can use me I am available I, I know you have no hands but my hand no no feet but my feet no mouth but my mouth nobody wants to be used by God we just want to use God and God is saying is there anybody left in the body of Christ that we will not use me as a sugar daddy, but but will see me as El Elyon that, that understand there is no greater power than me. I, 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 I know for this for this generation what I'm speaking now might as well be Swahili uh, because you don't even know what it means to pray to ask God use me that hallelujah I wish I had some real believers in this room that are at the place in your life that so many people have used me I might as well let God use me that, that there's a call on my life there's an assignment there's a drive and this is how you know it's from God when God I called you to do something you don't want to do it when he called you to do something you don't know how to do but just say God I'm yours he says I'm looking for some people who are not looking for what they can get but will declare what shall I render 
for all of these blessings. Do, do you not know there's a major ministry assignment over your life? There's, there's a gift that God has given you in your testimony and you have reduced God to the home shopping network. God, God said, do you think I died for you to get shoes? Do you, do you think the blood was just for you to get a BMW? I, I made a sacrifice because I want you to act like me. And, and in acting like me, you understand, I can walk away from position and power and influence and money because I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. I can't get no real people in here. What God is calling you to do, it may pay you less. What God is calling you to do, your family may not agree with it. What God is calling you to do doesn't match your background, your pedigree, or your education. But God said, I'd rather you be happy on minimum wage than be depressed as a millionaire. If you know what the call of God is. And that kind of lost thinking in Christendom is that we're never asking God, do you see anything in me that can be used, watch this, that doesn't require public recognition? <sighs> Will you be faithful if you don't get a mic? God, I, I, I can't hear nobody if... If you never get a certificate, if, if nobody ever calls you up front, if, if your name ain't in the paper, but will God be able to trust you to do ministry and nobody even knows what you're doing, but you got a sense of fulfillment that I'm obedient to the call of God over my life. And we can't do it because we only interpret scripture in terms of what's in it for me and so we have inherited the degenerate gene of the previous generation to see the gospel as only for me if you look at our text today, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, in the neo-Pentecostal construct, uh, in postmodern church, here it is, when you hear the text, for I know the plans I have for you. Uh, the Lord's plans are to prosper you and, and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. Ah, when you hear that, something resonates in you to know, to know God's got plans for me. Would you, would you look at your neighbor and say, he's got plans for me. He's got plans. And so in this text, Jeremiah 29, verse number 11, we know it, we memorized it, we shouted about it. And the critical question I've got to ask you, do you understand it? Because in the context of the text, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the plans that I have for you are to prosper you uh, and not to harm you. Hear me. Uh, he's speaking now uh, to the children of Israel, watch this, who are in crisis. They're in crisis because it looks like they are headed to slavery. They're headed to slavery, and a hundred years prior, a hundred years prior, the Armenians had come in and had captured them, and God delivered them. This is getting ready to mess you up, preachers. And so they started going to church. When they started going to church, because they felt like they were getting ready to be enslaved, and pastors who didn't have an ear from God, but were preaching to tickle the emotions of the people, begin to tell them, you're going to be delivered. You are not going to be in bondage. You will not know struggle. And the people begin to shout. And God had to send them a message. Yes, I delivered you a hundred years ago, but I'm not going to do it this time. Y'all don't like this here. Yeah. I'm not going to deliver you this time. You will be captured. You will be held hostage. The enemy is going to prevail for a season. But I want you to understand what I'm saying to you is that even while you are trapped, you still going to get blessed. Not some, some of y'all just missed that and I, I need some believers in the room the reason why your haters can't figure you out is that even while you are trapped God still found a way out for 
of you. And I, 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 I know some of y'all can only praise him when you get out of it, but this is for radical worshipers who know God will anoint me while I'm stuck in it. He'll, he'll make a way for me. This ain't the job I like. This ain't where I want to live. This ain't a healthy relationship, but God will bless me while I'm in it. Be seated, please. I, I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but there's somebody who needs to know, hallelujah, that even if God don't get you out of it, he'll bless you while you're in it. That was good. Somebody tweet that for me. I said, even if he don't get you out of it, he'll bless you while you in it. And I got some witnesses in the room that pastor you talking to me right now. Because I'm in something I don't understand. But I got to testify I'm still blessed. I, I, I don't understand why God has left me in it. But he still made a way while I'm in it. So dealing, ladies and gentlemen, with the context of the text, we ignore the fact that Jerusalem gets looted. That Jerusalem gets looted, and not only does Jerusalem get looted, it gets burned. To add insult to injury, uh, Zedekiah's children have now been taken hostage. And the greatest insult is that the enemy makes Zedekiah watch. Please forgive me, I'm not even talking to you right now. I'm talking to somebody in the room who's had to watch your child go through. Oh my God, you, you, could, you couldn't do nothing to help them. But hallelujah, you, you were frustrated because you saw them making some bad decisions and some poor choices. And, and you were trying to figure out how do I get involved? How, how do I intervene without overstepping my bow? And God did not even let you get into it because he had to allow that child to go through some stuff just so that they could see the hand of God at work for themselves. I, I know some of y'all got perfect children, but I, I, I need some people in the room that have seen your children go through hell and high water, and you couldn't understand why they kept going through the same vicious cycle. God said your seasoning was making you watch. I don't know why they keep doing this. I, I don't know why they keep falling in love with the wrong people. I, I don't know why they can't see the people who they think are their friends are really jealous of them. I, I don't understand how they got all these opportunities and they won't maximize it. I, I wish when I was their age I had this kind of doors open in front of me. I don't understand. I give them everything and they still seem to be unmotivated. God said, watch! And after he had to witness his children being afflicted, they came for Zedekiah and poked his eyes out. Hallelujah. I, I, I don't know where you are in this room, but some of you ought to be shouting for what God didn't let you see. Oh. God, that was... Did you hear what I just said? You, you ought to be shouting for what you never saw. You, you ought to thank God that when you got home, you never saw your furniture in the lit outside. You, 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 you ought to thank God as bad as it is that you ain't never seen a doctor over your body saying, I only give you three weeks to live. You, you, you ought to be thankful under God that you never saw a judge sentence you to life with no possibility of parole. Let me talk to some church folk. The reason the reason why I shout, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seen their sea begging for bread. You, you ought to shout for what God didn't let you see. You see the place. So now, I'm not talking about heathens. I'm talking about the children of God are in bondage. The enemy 
seems to be winning. They got shackles and manacles around their wrists and around their ankles. Watch this. And while they're in bondage, God breaks into the plantation. While they're in bondage, here's what God says. God says, I got plans for you. Oh my God, the reason, hallelujah. Folk don't even understand why you went through the darkest season of your life. That the only reason why you didn't have a nervous breakdown, the only reason why you didn't commit suicide, the only reason why you didn't wave the white flag, not because everything been good, but I've been giving God glory because I know he still got plans for my life and I, I know some of y'all can't shout but if if you believe what you got right now it's all you gonna get you ain't gotta praise her. but I need those of you who believe by faith he got a plan for my life I, I don't know when it's gonna come to pass but I ain't shouting over possessions I'm shouting cause there's a plan Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I'm waiting on 500 of y'all to wake up. Would you just shout out loud, there's a plan for my life. If, if you don't think you're going to go nowhere, don't say nothing. But if you know there's some things God got in mind for you, I need you to lift up your voice. There's a plan for my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see the plus. You see the plus. Hiya. Jeez. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I don't know who I'm talking to, but uh, hallelujah. I just need 80 of y'all, even at the risk of looking crazy. Would you just say it out loud? There's a plan for my life. There. Hallelujah. I, I don't know where God got me going, but I believe God getting ready to shift some stuff on my behalf. I, I need you to declare out loud. There's a plan for my life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm trying not to mess up this service. Look at your neighbor and say, that ain't your last job. There's a plan for your life. Look at somebody else and say, don't get comfortable in that house. God got somewhere else for you to live. There's a plan for your life. Hallelujah. 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 Be seated, please. Please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got to go. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hey. Thank you. Hallelujah. The devil is a liar. God, I, I feel something getting ready to break in the room. I said the devil is a liar. Satan, if you can hear me, the blood of Jesus is against you. There's a plan for my life. I ain't going to stay depressed. I'm not going to stay broke. There's a plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah, we got to move. But I need 50 of you to just upset every demonic force assigned to mess up your life. Would you just shout out loud, there's a plan for my life. through right now God told me to tell you this is not a part of the plan you are not going to stay in the position you in there's a plan for your life hallelujah 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 be seated please 
Hallelujah. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. Be seated, please, right where you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm trying to move. I don't know what's happening in here. But God said, I speak to every negative force that's been trying to pull your life backwards. I speak to every obstacle, to every curse, to every hater, to every unpaid bill. I need the redeemed of the Lord to shout with confidence. There is a plan for my life. Be seated, please. Be seated, please, right where you are. And the problem, be seated, please. The problem with the text, Rod, is we have interpreted the text uh, through a Western civilization mindset for the me generation. So when we read the text, we're reading it, here it is, as individuals. For the plans I have for you. So your problem is you took that personally. Y'all just missing that. As if God were just speaking to you. When he sent Jeremiah into the camp, Jeremiah, watch this, is only almost five million in the camp. Jeremiah ain't got time to talk to everybody one at a time to say that there's a plan for you. 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 So when Jeremiah gives the prophetic declaration, he is not talking to individuals. He's talking to everybody in the camp. God, I can't hear nobody. He said, anybody that trusts God while you still in bondage. There's a plan for you. I can't find my real worshipers in here. He said, when you give me glory 930 service, I'm not just going to bless you, but I'm going to bless every person on your row that learned how to trust me when they had their back up against the wall. I'm going to bless. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look. Look down your row and say, I got a prophecy for y'all. There's a blessing coming. Some of y'all better change seats. I said, look down your row and say, I got a prophecy for y'all. Hallelujah, something is coming. God ain't just talking to me, but he's talking to everybody in the tail. That you getting ready to be the head and not the tail. You, you going to be a lender and not a borrower. He ain't talking to me. Okay. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If y'all understood the intention of the text, you'd be shouting better than this. What you saying, Rev? I'm saying to you, everybody in the camp is on a come up. Everybody in the camp is about to be upgraded. Everybody in the camp is your season for promotion. He ain't talking to one. He's talking to the whole camp. Okay. Be seated. My time's about up. 11.30 is coming. Be seated. Right where y'all. I got to show you one last nuance and revelation to the text. Uh, Watch this. The other part of the problem, ladies and gentlemen, the other part of the problem is that uh, in us uh, learning or leaning through the text through egocentrism, we have no concept of time. So we always uh, look at the gospel or look at the text in the perfect present tense. That it is what it is. Now that it is, it will no longer be as it was because he is. So we try to maximize the moment in terms of time.
So here's what God says through the prophet Jeremiah. I've got plans for you. <sighs> plans to prosper you and not to do you harm. Now watch this, because they internalize the text out of their own limited, demented thinking. Watch this, we thought it was for us. It's getting ready to mess you up. But from the time of the word being declared to the manifestation of the prophetic utterance, there is a span of 50 years. So from the time God spoke it to when it actualized, 50 years had to happen. All right, so in that time, some people died. Some people never saw it come to pass. Watch this, and now another generation comes up who wasn't even around during the original prophecy. Let me see if I can help you. Wednesday, yes. Wednesday will be exactly 50 years since the I have a dream speech. Y'all ain't talking back to me. And there's a whole generation that never saw what King prophesied come to pass, including the prophet himself. Because it wasn't even for that generation. He had to wait for three generations to pass so that the next generation won't be infected with their parents' dis-ease of not believing God for the unusual. Look at your neighbor say, it ain't about you. It ain't, it ain't about you. Let me see if I can help you. All right. So 50 years ago, yes, 50 years ago, my late uh, sainted grandfather, Bishop Harrison James Bryant, whose name I share, Bishop Harrison Bryant, watch this. He drove the bus from the church. Y'all don't like this here. Vice President of Baltimore NAACP, he drove the church van to the March on Washington. My dad went to the March on Washington, watch this, but in 50 years ago, there was no jumbotron. Mm -hmm. So the young people had to climb trees in order just to see. So I need you to get this. My grandfather is driving the bus. My father is up in the tree. Both trying to see because they're believing there's a prophecy that God's got a plan. But God help me. My grandfather is no longer here. My father could not make it. But the grandson spoke at the march. Y'all getting ready to miss it. So what was spoken was not for my grandfather. It was not for my father. It was for me. Now I wasn't born yet. Y'all ain't talking back to me. My dad had not met my mother. But the plans he had for me was to prosper me. Y'all are missing your shout. God said when you shout, it is not for you to get blessed. I want you to shout for your unborn grandchildren that the stop. Hey. Oh. Hey. I can't hear nobody. I said I need you to shout for the members of your family that haven't even been born yet. That the struggle you know your grandchildren will never know because it ain't about you. Okay. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. My time is up. My time is up. Be seated, please. Please, please. While I was gone, y'all got a spirit of disobedience. I'm back. Come be seated right where y'all are. All right? God says, I want to see the level of your maturity and what strands of post-colonial imperialism are still in your worship. Do you have the maturity and the selflessness? God help me. Because you almost messed up the service and interrupted the sermon when you thought it was about your plans. But, but God says, remind them, I am not the God of individuals. I'm the God of generations. So when you formally introduce me, you introduce me as the father of Abraham, Isaac, and 
and Jacob. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Now of the three, Jacob is the least devout, but is the greatest one blessed. The reason why we can give God glory is because we know we don't deserve the blessing. But we know we get ready to get it anyway. It's going make you crazy depending on what your mindset is. God says, I need you to give me glory. Like you believe every child that is born into your family will never know what poverty looks like. Now, if you can't think, God. I need you to shout like they'll never need student loans. I need you to give God glory like they won't need another march 50 years from now. I need you to praise God like you believe there'll be no more stand your ground law. No more stop and frisk. No more racial profiling. No more redlining the zip codes. I need you to shout like you believe the next generation will have a better way of life. Lift up that hand, sir, ma'am. Oh. Said so the plan, ladies and gentlemen, is not for your present. Watch clause C of the text, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Clause C. Is that everything you're worshiping for is not for the present. Everything that you're worshiping God for 